Okay. Speak slower. Was it that? Testing, testing, one, two, three. Okay. Uh, and then were we ahead of schedule? Like, were you, was there too much time? Oh. And for the translation, right? everyone uh, we're gonna get ready to start soon if you could start heading to your seats sit down Okay, I see people still shuffling in. Welcome, good morning, please take a seat.
Hi, so we'll get started in one minute. Uh, for those of you who need to get your last bit of coffee before we get started. Otherwise... Okay, the doors are closed, which means we're ready to get started. Good morning, everyone, distinguished guests and participants. Uh, welcome to today's regional roundtable entitled Solutions for Climate Resilience in Th Southeast Asia. Um, climate Roundtable from Science to Policy and Practice. And welcome also to people joining us uh, digitally. So the round table is a part of the Mekong Environmental Resilience Week 2024, organized by the Stockholm Environment Institute Asia Center in collaboration with Chulalongkorn University and supported by Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, DFAT. Uh, my name is Hui John Wu. I'm a journalist with the Associated Press. And it is an honor to be your host for today's event, uh, which is now in its second year. So Southeast Asia stands on the front lines of climate change, as I think everyone in this room knows. And we are facing threats such as rising sea levels, biodiversity loss, and challenges arising from climate-induced migration. These challenges jeopardize the livelihoods of millions in this region, with vulnerable communities bearing the brunt of the challenge. But the region's deeply Interconnected environmental, environmental issues call for urgent and coordinated action that prioritizes equitable and just solutions to strengthen resilience for both people and ecosystems. So today's Climate Roundtable welcomes policymakers, researchers, civil society representatives, development practitioners, also a few journalists uh, from across the Mekong region and Southeast Asia. And, you know, this is really meant as a chance for everyone to come together, right, to exchange ideas, uh, to identify specific policy gaps, and also opportunities to pursue equitable solutions that prioritize justice for communities and the ecosystem. So we're really hoping today is just gonna be a good organic exchange of ideas and hoping some great conversations arise from the panels um, and the breakout sessions in the afternoon. And so with that, all that said, I'm gonna ask uh, our four main speakers this morning to come sit on stage. Uh, so Ms. Emily Death, Mr. Pavich Keshavon, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, Professor Willart, Puriwart, Puriwat, uh, Mr. Leonard Bog. Uh, please come up on stage. Uh, 
And then to officially open today's event, I would like to call on Ms. Emily Death, Acting Counselor, Development of the Australian Embassy, for her welcoming remarks. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Regional Climate Roundtable, Solutions for Climate Resilience in Southeast Asia, from Science to Policy and Practice. A warm welcome to our partners and friends, and particularly, I would like to acknowledge uh, Deputy Director General of Thailand's Department of Cli Climate Change and Environment, the President of Chulalongkorn University, and the Chair of the Stockholm Environment Institute. Uh, as many of us in this room are aware, uh, parts of Thailand are experiencing historic levels of flooding. We have also witnessed the devastation of Super Typhoon Yagi has caused across the Mekong subregion. It is reported to be one of the most destructive typhoons to have ever hit northern Vietnam. The record-breaking amount of rain has caused extensive flooding in Laos and northern Thailand. And uh, experts have noted climate change exacerbated its intensity. Typhoon Yagi is yet another example and reminder that the, climate that the climate crisis is a transboundary crisis that demands international cooperation. But it also demands local voices. Without listening and considering the perspectives of those who are most impacted by climate disasters, we risk developing ineffective responses. And at the heart of this roundtable is the practice of evidence-based policy making, which is essential to support, and it is essential to support locally-led research that produces the evidence that, that informs regional and national approaches to climate. Our work with SEI on the Mekong Thought Leadership and Think Tanks program has this objective at its core by providing research grants to regional and local organisations. Some of these studies address critical transboundary issues such as sustainable design against urban heat, improving water storage, and also building smart cities. Australia supports building the capacity of promising water and climate researchers through our Mekong Fellowships Program. Uh, I think it's, as of today, we have 32 fellows coming from Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam who are deepening local knowledge on water security and climate change in the Mekong subregion. And, and these are just a few examples of how Australia is currently supporting locally led development in the Mekong subregion. Uh, but for over 40 years, but for over 70 years, Australia has worked with Mekong partners through our long-standing development assistance work. And because of our historic of our history here, we recognise and we also understand the particular challenges faced by the Mekong subregion. And we remain a committed, responsive and practical partner. This year, our Foreign Minister announced an additional $222 million to support further initiatives such as this one here today, to contribute to a region that is peaceful, stable and prosperous. Uh, thank you to SEI Asia and to Alongkorn University for co-hosting this event, and thank you to everyone here today for taking the time to join us. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Matt, the staff. Um, one note uh, I forgot to mention: there is simultaneous translation available um, if you go outside and get one of the low translators and we have Thai, Vietnamese, Laos and Khmer. Uh, so if you need that, uh, please make, uh, please go make yourself <laughs> available of that. Um, now I would like to miss, invite Mr. Leonard Bogue, the chairperson of the board of the SEI Institute uh, to present his remarks. It's great to see so many of you here for this occasion today. And uh, I would like to welcome you, all distinguished guests, 
Ms. Emily Dutt, who we just heard from Australian Embassy, Mr. Pravic K. Savawung, Deputy Director General of the Department of Climate Change and Environment in Thailand, and Professor Vilet Purivat, President Shulaongkorn University, and all of you distinguished guests. It's really a great pleasure to be here for me to represent the work of SEI in Asia. Although I'm coming from Stockholm, I feel very much part of this region and the work you do. And to meet you are many partners and colleagues who have supported our work for over the past 20 years. Two decades ago, SEI recognized the rapid changes occurring across Asia and established the center in Bangkok in 2004. The vision was clear. Development in the region would bring new social and environmental challenges and SEI's local presence could make a meaningful contribution to shaping sustainable policies. Since then, our center here in Bangkok has been active in addressing key environmental and developmental issues in Asia, in the Asia region. Our legacy in the region spans a broad range of areas, climate change adaptation, water management, gender equality, social equity and poverty, disaster risk reduction, and sustainable energy transitions. And much of this is on display for you to see at the exhibition and outside here today. Our approach is to work at the intersection of science, policy, and best practice, promoting collaboration and capacity building to address these often very daunting challenges, as the previous speaker spoke about and as we all know. So we gather here today during the Mekong Environmental Resilience Week to find solutions for climate resilience in Southeast Asia. One of our most important contributions has been the work in the Mekong River Basin, where water governance is critical for millions of people. Through the Sustainable Mekong Research Network, the SummerNet, founded in 2005, and the Mekong Thought Leadership and Think Tank Program, supported by DFAT since 2022, we have supported research and policy development to address water governance issues. SummerNet and MTT have fostered partnerships between governments, researchers, and local communities to ensure sustainable management of this crucial waterway. The project's emphasis on transboundary water governance and climate resilience has strengthened cooperation between the countries in the Mekong region. Beyond environmental sustainability, SEI has prioritized gender equality and social inclusion in its projects in Asia. The Strategic Collaborative Fund, the SCF, running from 2018 to 2024, integrated gender and rights-based approaches into environmental governance, giving women, indigenous peoples, and other marginalized groups a voice in regional discussions and ensuring that they play an active role in decision-making. SCA will this fall launch its new five-year strategy by the end of 2024. And this new strategy seeks to consolidate our successes and drive renewal so that we are ready to serve as an effective partner in tackling the great environmental and societal challenges we all face here and across the globe. Our new strategy focus, clearly focuses on boosting research for implementation because the world must now act with urgency to meet our global commitments and goals. We all know we have the goals, we have the analysis, we urgently need to act, to focus on action. Time is short. As was emphasized most recently at the Summit of the Future at the UN, clear examples of how this will be operationalized by SEI in Asia include 
an increased, among many other areas, an increased focus on inclusive climate finance that reaches vulnerable communities to build climate resilience. Water governance, transboundary climate risk management, clean air and energy, and a focus on understanding the effects of climate change on migration and mobility are other prioritized areas moving forward. Through all these efforts, SEI in Asia will continue to play an active and supportive role in shaping regional environmental policies and to support the delivery of the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals. SEI's comprehensive approach, integrating science, policy and practice with a focus on accelerated implementation is only made possible through you, our esteemed partners in this room and beyond. Thank you for listening and I look forward to our continued strong collaboration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bogue. Uh, now I would like to call Mr. Pavich Keisha Lalong, the Deputy Director General at the Department of Climate Change and Environment here in Thailand to speak. So uh, very good morning, uh, Ms. Uh, Emily Das, the Acting uh, Counselor, Dep Department of State uh, Embassy in Thailand, and uh, Professor uh, Willard Puriwat, President of the Jilongkorn University, Mr. Uh, Leonard Bouquet, the sh chairperson of the board of uh, SEI, uh, distinguished uh, guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, once again, a uh, very uh, warm welcome to uh, Bangkok, Thailand. And first of all, I'd like to uh, express my uh, sincere appreciation to the Stockholm Environment Institute and Jilongkorn University with the generous support uh, from the Australian uh, Embassy to convening the meaningful uh, event. And of course, uh, inviting the Department of Climate Change and Environment to be uh, um, welcome remarks in the Mekong Environment Resilient Week and Climate Roundtable today. Uh, evidently that uh, the impact of the climate change is uh, very uh, severe to our mankind and of course uh, in our region is uh, very uh, vulnerable in the in the world of course uh, very sub uh, Thailand um, Laos Cambodia and Vietnam of course and uh, Myanmar therefore I think that uh, we are able to uh, step up and uh, overcome this uh, very uh, challenges to us and of course uh, this meeting is very timely and we are able to gather in to discuss and uh, finding the way that uh, how we can uh, address the uh, devastating uh, event. For Thailand we have uh, many activities uh, to coping with the, the climate change issues. And we are aligned with the UNFCCC that uh, we uh, hope that we go along and go on track of the 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, from the Paris Agreement. And it's very challenge to Thailand because uh, of course we are a very vulnerable country and we just, uh, the country that uh, uh, emitted the greenhouse gas very little in, in the world. But uh, for the member state of the UNFCCC, we have to uh, go along with the, the, the global uh, commitment. And I think that uh, for the adaptation, uh, we introduced the uh, National Action Plan on Adaptation with the um, is many issues that uh, we are trying to uh, reverse our activities and um, uh, for example, like water management, uh, agriculture and uh, food security, uh, tourism, public health, uh, natural resources management and human settlement and security. Uh, this effort uh, is uh, involved the integration of action from the relevant ministry at our level, 
of course, in the central provincial as well as the local authority. Moreover, Thailand plays a very important on the preparedness of the impact of the climate change. We are currently in the process of uh, developing the long-term climate risk uh, projection to uh, disseminate with the public and improve the early warning system, including developing uh, the emergency alert system, which is capable to effective uh, reaching people in high-risk area yeah, in our country. And for the, the mitigation, uh, we have the submit the mitigation action to the, hopefully, uh, we try to uh, give the approval from the cabinet uh, in very soon that uh, with the action plan on mitigation, we are able to uh, coping with the relevant agency to, uh, for example, like the energy sectors to uh, uh, introduce the renewable energy as well as the uh, energy efficiency uh, activities uh, and the carbon capture storage technology uh, and so on. For the transportation, we will be focusing on the promoting the EV and improving the vehicle efficiency. Uh, waste and industrial uh, wastewater management is very uh, crucial that we try to uh, the we try to uh, engage the industry and households uh, activity to uh, reduce the wastewater and uh, uh, solid waste. Uh, of course, uh, the uh, agriculture is very important uh, to Thailand. So we introduced many uh, new uh, innovative uh, agriculture uh, scheme to the farmers, for example, like the uh, rice namas as well as the uh, rice stock uh, uh, measures. And the Thailand is projected to reduce the greenhouse gas emission by uh, 222 million tons, uh, carbon dioxide equivalent, by 2030. This is uh, our the first uh, NDC. And for the next NDC, uh, hopefully that we are able to uh, leverage uh, our uh, target. Uh, I, we don't know yet, but uh, for the global uh, discussion, that we uh, try to move like reach to the 60% 60, 60 worldwide. So I think that uh, many activity uh, has been introduced and uh, more policy is very um, uh, uh, concrete. But uh, without the uh, legislation, uh, we, that is the vehicle to moving uh, forward uh, our uh, climate change activity. Therefore, we are drafting the Climate Change Act. Uh, to uh, address uh, f for uh, mitigation action and uh, as well as the adaptation action. Uh, hopefully that uh, we making the draft of the Climate Change Act uh, uh, enter into force uh, within two years, next two years, hopefully that. And I think that uh, the Department uh, of Climate Change and Environment has uh, been working uh, actively with the um, many countries uh, uh, in the area of the biodiversity action and uh, restoration. So we think that uh, we introduced the nature based solution and uh, we very thanks uh, from, for the uh, Australian support for the resilient urban center and surround project and as well as the project on the strengthened capacity and local plan for climate change adaptation in agriculture and food security se sectors in Thailand. It's much ap appreciated to the uh, Australian uh, embassy. For the, I think uh, we working with, uh, not only in relevant or uh, neighboring country, but uh, we uh, try to uh, working with uh, uh, multilateral and as well as the bilateral uh, uh, discussion. So uh, last but not least, I think that the climate change is uh, no longer a distant threat. Uh, I think that uh, 
the lone individual cannot single hand deal with the climate change, but a collective effort is from every single individual to tra foster transformative uh, change at the domestic and international level are very neat. And with the solidarity in the sub-region, of course, uh, uh, we will uh, move forward and able to uh, overcome the, the, the problem of the climate change as well as we are looking forward to become the resilient uh, sub-region. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so lastly, I would like to give the floor to Professor Willard Puriwat, the president of Chulalongkorn University. Good morning. I'm Miss Emily Dash, uh, Acting Counselor Department uh, Development, Australian Embassy, Thailand. Uh, Mr. Pavit Gersawabong, Deputy Director General, uh, Department of Climate Change and Environment in uh, Thailand. Uh, Mr. Lennart Bogey, uh, Chairperson of the Board of Stockholm Environment Institute. Uh, distinguished guests and esteemed participants, it is my great honor for me to be here today and take part in this important gathering, the Mekong Environmental Resilient Week 2024. I would like to extend my sincere thanks to the Stockholm Environment, uh, Environment Institute, SEI, for hosting this critical event and for your continued leadership in addressing the pressing uh, environmental challenge we face. This collaboration truly highlights the power of global partnership in solving region, regional issues. Today, we come together because the Mekong region is facing unprecedented threat from climate change rising sea levels, unpredictable weather, and the degrada uh, degradation of ecosystems are no longer distant possibilities. There are urgent realities. The effect of this change are being felt by millions across Southeast Asia, affecting livelihood, communities, and future generations. Our task today is not merely to discuss this issue, but to move towards solutions. The time up for observation has passed, and now is the moment to act with decisiveness and resolve. The focus of this roundtable solution for climate change resilience in Southeast Asia calls for exactly that actionable, impactful strategy that will help safeguard the future of our region. At Chulalongkorn University, we believe in leading by example. As one of Thailand's premier institutions, we are committed to creating solutions that are not only grounded in research, but are also practical and sustainable. However, we know that we cannot do this alone. This is why gatherings like today are so vital. They are allow us to pool our collective knowledge, expertise, and resources. The challenges ahead are great, but so are the opportunities. By working together, academics, policymakers, civil society, and development partners. We have the power to drive transformative change. Our discussion today must lead to concrete actions, and those actions must lead to real-world results. We are not just talking about the future. We are shaping it. Let us use this platform to foster both idea, form partnerships, and most importantly, to create solutions that will protect the Mekong region and build a more resilient and sustainable Southeast Asia. The stakes are high, but together we can rise to meet the challenge. On behalf of Chulalongkorn University, I extend my deepest gratitude for each, to each of you for your dedication to this course. Let today's discussion mark the beginning of a shared journey toward a stronger and more resilient future for Mekong region. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Uh, and now, wait, Mr. Puriwat, please stay standing. Uh, as I understand that Jula Longkor wanted to present some gifts to our other keynote speakers.
Oh, and now Mr. Uh, Leonard Bogue will present gifts from SCI to the other keynote speakers. everyone uh, and now it's time for our group photo so everyone sitting in the audience please come up uh, we can stand along the front of the stage and we're all gonna take a group photo oh, okay. oh, okay. wait oh sorry okay the photographer will be on the stage, so we stand facing the stage, uh, gather towards the middle. Okay, keep moving towards the middle, please. It's a wide angle lens, but it's not gonna be that wide, so we need to get concentrated. It's okay to squeeze. All right, squeeze closer, please. Move, move closer to the center.
Hi, everyone. OK. Please stay seated. We have one more. We have a keynote speaker coming up. Have some quiet for our next speaker. I will call to the stage Mr. Leo Horn Patanotai. He's the founder of the Asian Fair Transitions Labs and a SEI affiliate. Uh, Mr. Leo Horn Patanotai, please come to the stage. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here uh, today with you, and um, I want to commend Stockholm Environment Institute and Tula for, uh, for assembling this, uh, this fabulous group today, working on such an important topic. Thank you also to the uh, Swedish and Australian governments for uh, supporting this event. I'm here to give you all a break. I realize it's early in the day, uh, but really you do deserve it. This is a tough business that we're in. You know, even on the good days, when it feels like we've pushed a big boulder up the hill, we're hit with the Sisyphean nature of our work as we contemplate this infinite mountain range ahead of us. And when you zoom out of the piece of the jigsaw puzzle that you're working on, I think we all realize that this quest that we're on is a quest that has no end. There is no kind of end point, arrival point at which we can give us ourselves a pat on the back. So our work is forever unfinished. And I myself have been working for over two decades in this valley of infinite peaks at the intersection of environment and development. As an economist, as an advocate, as a diplomat, as an activist, as an advisor. And the work doesn't get any easier. And indeed, the more the urgency to act increases, the more it seems that we face resistance. So it can be quite frustrating, as well as being daunting. All that said, after more than two decades, I feel more optimistic and more hopeful than I've ever been before. And I don't mean to say this with, um, in a kind of toxically positive manner. Um, I am, at least I think I am, trying to be sober about the the challenge, challenging reality that we face. The fact that after two decades, we still face daunting gaps of all kinds. We face an implementation gap that's compounded by, by an ambition gap. We also all, every day, struggle with a gap that we continue to see between good research, knowledge, and policy, between policy and good outcomes. And let's not kid ourselves. Things will get worse before they get better. But there are at least three good reasons that I have to be optimistic, and that's what I would like to share with you all today. First, let's take note of the fact that this team is, is growing stronger. You know, the team is expanding. This used to be a very, very lonely and isolated business. When I started off in the uh, UK government, in the, what was in the UK Department for International Development, um, there were only three of us working on this issue, on this intersection of climate and development, on, on, on adaptation. In fact, adaptation wasn't really, it was a real exotic kind of uh, issue. And, um, you know, lots of people didn't really want to spend too much, you know, wanted to give us too much attention. It was, it was a lonely time. Um, at COP last year, uh, sorry, 2016, uh, uh, 2021, 
there were over 200 people in, in the FCDO who were working, this is the UK uh, foreign office where I started my career, working on these issues. When I joined the World Resources Institute um, 12, 13 years ago, only 300 people, now pushing on 3,000 people working there. So more and more people are joining the team, and also we get more diversity of the people joining. We see the white stripe brigade joining, you know, the, the lawyers, the accountants, the insurers are taking a big interest in, in the issues ahead of us. Um, so our work is increasingly valued and, and recognized, and we're attracting really the best minds um, and the best talents to our cause. This has become the cool thing to work on. We are attracting the best of the best. And we're also finding better ways to work with each other. And what we're doing today and this week, I think, is one example of that. Now, the depressing underpinning of that observation is, is the fact that things are getting worse. That's why people are more aware. That's why there's a greater alertness to the issue. Impacts are escalating. Climate change is no longer seen as it was even just a few years ago as a distant um, risk. It's seen as the present threat that's unfolding before our eyes. So the tanker, yes, it's still on course, on a collision course with this big iceberg. But what gives me heart, the first thing is, is, is that there are more people on board to steer this ship into a different direction. The second reason for my optimism is that the ground is already shifting beneath our feet. The journey to a low carbon, climate resilient future is already underway. And it might be difficult to, to see this. It might not seem obvious. You know, we get drowned out by this stromboscopic deluge of, of alarming news every day, right? But if you take a step back and just think about how far we've come in these last 10 years, 10 years ago, we didn't have a universal uh, goal to cap temperature rises to um, 1.5 to 2 degrees. In fact, back then, 1.5 was seen as a fringe position, right? Everybody was still talking about 2 degrees. No one was talking about net zero. Investment in fossil fuels back then far trumped investment in renewable energy. <clears throat> EVs were a niche. Adaptation was very much the neglected middle child between the much more glamorous and attention-grabbing sisters of mitigation and finance. Since the Paris Agreement, though, we truly have entered, I think this is clear for all of us to see, we take a step back. We've entered a, a new phase of climate action. We have a universal framework for action, that's one thing. For the first time, we have more than 90% of the global economy that's covered by a net zero goal. And all countries are, are aligning around 1.5. Now remember, as we were heading into Paris in uh, 2015, the world back then, I think this was maybe analysis that uh, SEI did, uh, was on course for warming of more than 3.5 3 degrees. So in a way, we already started to course correct. And momentum for net zero and for climate resilience is building all around the world. We see it in the companies that have come forth to make bold commitments to uh, uh, emissions reductions in line with what science says is needed, the SBT, science-based targets. We have companies that account for over 40% of the world's market capitalization that have made these commitments. We have jurisdictions representing more than 55% of the world economy that have made moves to adopt stringent international sustainability reporting standards. So things are moving. Countries, companies, cities, communities are mobilizing. They're galvanizing and jockeying for advantage in what will be a low carbon and climate resilient future. Our collective understanding of the issue has also evolved. We now hear journalists, politicians, students, um, people of all ages talking about the triple crisis, the interconnectedness of our nature crisis, of inequality crisis, and our climate crisis. That in itself is a, is, is a quantum leap in terms of mind shift, in, in terms of mindset and understanding. 
And of course, we're seeing more pressure all around the world, day by day, for more ambitious climate action. We see that in increasingly successful uh, strategic litigation uh, by activists, youth activists, that have led to profound policy changes in the EU, in, uh, in the US, in the UK, and in many other countries. Most recently, we saw that in uh, Korea, South Korea, uh, just a month ago. Uh, youth activists who su succeeded in suing the government for more ambitious climate action. Uh, we're seeing also transformative adaptation going from a concept, an academic concept, to actually informing the development strategy of a, of a country, uh, Bangladesh. So we are in the midst of a state shift, and the shape of state shifts is not a linear one, right? It's, it's an S-curve. Things seem trudgingly slow, painfully so, right, at the beginning, and impossible, until momentum picks up and when you reach takeoff point, things really start accelerating. And it feels in many areas that we are already nearing that point. And indeed, there are signals from the future of what is to come. Look at the, just last week, the UK having closed its last coal-fired power plant, a truly iconic milestone in our journey towards to, to decarbonization. This is the land where the Industrial Revolution started. Our addiction to fossil fuels started in the UK. Within 12 years, they were able to, to phase coal out entirely of the power supply, reducing energy-related emissions by three quarters. They did that in 12 years. So expectations of what is possible are shifting. China may already have peaked 10 years ahead of schedule. This is, of course, very significant. It's a third of, the global, uh, of global emissions that we're talking about. The third reason for my optimism is that this triple crisis of inequality, of nature, of climate, will eventually strong arm us into choosing a better path forward. It will compel us to find a more inclusive, uh, greener path forward. I'm reminded of um, the words of Brian Eno, uh, who was at a, a dinner uh, I, I was at uh, recently, um, a few years ago actually, in the UK, and um, asked how he was feeling about the climate crisis. His response was short-term pessimist, long-term optimistic. And what he was getting was exactly the reality that I'm sharing with you that, that we will eventually, as things get worse, we will be forced to find better ways forward. I'm reminded also of uh, another dinner speaker I heard from, um, uh, this was 10 years back, um, Hannah J Jones, who was the then sustainability chief at, at Nike. And she exhorted the dinner crowd to think of and see the climate crisis not as a problem to be solved or, or an inescapable hell that we're kind of heading towards, but to think of it as an invitation to be bold an invitation to, to, to not be afraid, to, an invitation to courage. The beauty of, the climate tri of working on, on the issues that we work on is that we have the immense chance of working in an area that not only recognizes the myriad dimensions uh, of ourselves, but calls on all, all our talents to solve this challenge. And this, I think, is how we go from community to movement. So I want to end with um, uh, just recapping first. Three reasons I'm feeling very optimistic. Firstly, we're getting stronger. Secondly, the transition is already underway. And thirdly, it will eventually take us to a much better place. And why did I choose to speak with you about this? It's because I believe the quality of action really matters. We need to be able to sustain and maintain the level of effort. And broadly speaking, the three, three response options to climate, one, denial, or what you might call business as usual, uh, the ostrich burying its head in the sand. Now that, of course, I think does not pertain to anybody who's in this room, so I won't spend any time on that. But suffice to say that that's morally untenable. 
Second option is where I see most of the action today is, is the action of frantically scooping water out of a sinking ship. And that's when we're focusing on addressing the symptoms and trying to fix problems within a system that generates outcomes that we're striving against. And if, this is a, a very exhausting place to be, by the way. It's a place of fear. It's a place of desperation. And there's a much better place to be, which is building a better boat, right? And that calls on not just us to bring our knowledge to the table, but to, to, to really tap into our imaginations, to tap into our courage and into our humanity. So the flip side of the fact that this is a perpetual business that we're in, well, firstly, it's um, great job security. But more importantly, I think that the, uh, it makes every inch meaningful, right? The fact that this is a never-ending business, every step you take matters, and it all adds up. So I want to thank you all for being on this journey, and I look forward to continuing it with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Patanatai, for that note of optimism to start our sessions for today. Um, so I'm just going to give you guys a quick overview of what we're going to do. Uh, first, we are going to set the scene. We will have a panel that will delve into the critical climate challenges faced by Southeast Asia. Uh, and it will look at where the current response stands in light of international climate and sustainability agreements. It will explore these necessary transformations, focusing on areas such as agriculture, energy, water, transport, environment, and financing. And then we will have a second panel uh, looking at inspiring stories, so continuing the note of optimism, uh, looking at current solutions and innovations that are being implemented across the region. All right. And then before we take a break for lunch, uh, we will listen to highlights from yesterday's Mekong Regional Water, Energy, and Climate Policy Forum and how it connects to the broader Southeast Asia climate. And then when we come back from break, we will proceed with four parallel sessions. That's in the afternoon. Uh, and it's going to looking at nature-based solutions, just energy transitions, transboundary climate risks, and climate finance. And then we will end with a plenary session uh, to kind of summarize and synthesize all, all the information from these breakout panels. Uh, and then just a couple notes on housekeeping. Uh, for speakers, please speak a little bit slower so that our translators can translate for anyone who needs it. Uh, and that also helps you know, for everyone just to process the information that you're giving us. Uh, please keep your mobile phones on silent or do not disturb. And yeah, so with all that being said, I'm going to call to the stage Ms. Francesca Regalado. She's a journalist at Nikai Asia, and she's going to introduce our first panel for today. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Francesca Regalado. Um, I'm a correspondent with Nikkei Asia based in Thailand. Um, and I'm pleased to serve as the moderator for this panel discussion, setting the scene for uh, today's climate roundtable. Um, Southeast Asia's climate transition is well and truly underway, and it couldn't be more urgent. As a correspondent based in Southeast Asia, I've written stories about the region's battle on all fronts against drought, floods, and extreme weather, all while trying to satiate its demand for energy and water resources and food security. Uh, the question posed to our panel of experts today is how do we make the transition just and equitable? In the next hour, we'll hear examples of effective regional collab collaboration within the Mekong area and the ASEAN region, how to match ASEAN's increasing energy demands while decreasing our dependence on fossil fuels, new ways of storing energy to maximize ASEAN's wealth of renewable resources, adapting our food systems to climate impacts and changing demand, and finally, 
how do we pay for all of these necessary transformations? I'm pleased to introduce our distinguished panel, Dr. Francis X. Johnson, Senior Research Fellow at SEI. <laughs> Ms. Uh, Aldila Noor Rahima, Senior Researcher at the ASEAN Energy Center. Um, Dr. Jamie Pitock, Professor at Australia National University. Ms. Hang Pham, a Senior Res Resilience Officer at the Food and Agriculture Organization's Regional Office. And Ms. Christina Gregorio, Climate Finance Specialist at UNDP. Please. During the panel discussion, I'd like to ask the audience to jot down your questions for our experts on stage, um, and I'll open the floor for your questions at the end of the discussion. Uh, without further ado, uh, I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Johnson. Yeah, thanks a lot, Francesca. Um, I think we're gonna pick up on a, a number of the issues that uh, that Leo mentioned, and we'll try to put some numbers on them, so. Um, oh, this one, okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, sorry. Okay. So in this, in the first uh, session today, we're going to cover the um, um, sort of this broad context, setting the scene, and um, and we'll cover some of the key uh, sectors, some of the the key issues um, in a in a global and and regional perspective. Unfortunately, it's not advancing. No? Okay. So just uh, to fill in the time a little bit, um, our speakers today are covering, are covering water, energy, agriculture, and, and financial systems. And what we want to focus on is um, a little bit what Leo was talking about, the, the transitions, but also the system transformation. So rather than incremental change, uh, we're talking about um, transforming the, the systems to make these, these big leaps that we need to get to, get to the next. Uh, there we go. Okay. Thanks. Uh, still not working. Okay, you can change over there. Okay, we have a new, thanks. Okay, there we go. So coming on to this theme of transitions and system transformations, what, what I wanted to cover briefly before, before moving to our distinguished speakers is that um, the climate transition is occurring at this interface between people and, and nature. As Leo was, was talking about, and we live in a very urbanizing society, and yet we need, oops, we need, we need nature more than ever, actually, because 
Um, we need it for carbon management, we need it for biodiversity, and we need it for so many other issues. Uh, and so not to undertake this incremental change, um, you know, as Leo was talking about, but to engage in, in system transformation. And you see on the right that the, the idea being that the financial system is what uh, implements and what, what creates the capacity, but at the center is, is the social transformation. And then we have the different components. We have, we have urban, nature, agriculture, and so forth. So I'd like to uh, pick up on something that Leo mentioned, which is this rather historic event uh, of just about a week ago. And um, so the, the world's first uh, coal economy, basically, phasing out coal power. And the, it didn't actually start that long ago. It was actually the first power plant was 1882, but uh, nevertheless, um, if you look at this, this steep decline, but what I wanted to point out is two things, um, is that, first of all, if you look at the peak of this uh, use of coal for power, what happened around that time? It was London's great smog, which killed at least 4,000 people. It suspected it was many, many more. And so the transition for climate is very much connected to this transition in favor of health and well-being. So, um, and then if we look at this steep decline starting after that, most of it was not directed by policy and legislation per se, but as Leo was, was noting, in, in recent years, the, this accelerated, and this was as a direct result of, of public policy. So um, what I wanna cover next is a bit of a historical uh, tour for you, and um, there aren't so many people who can read the text in the room, those who are Swedish, but the text is not important in this case. What's interesting is one number, which is the fuel efficiency. The fuel efficiency of this car, which and this advertisement is from 1936, was six liters per kilometer. So I was very curious, um, sorry, it's six, six liters per 100 kilometers, it should say. Um, and so I was curious, what, how does that compare to today's? And um, it turns out that if you look at a modern car today, or let's say the, the average, it's actually the same. It's six liters per, per 100 kilometer, 85 years later, right? Um, so we're a little bit surprised at this in many ways, but um, so what I, the reason I point this out is because techno-economic innovation is necessary, but very far from sufficient. Um, system transformation means transitions that have public purpose, not just private gain. So um, going on to this issue of historical responsibility, um, more than half of the historical contribution to global warming, I think as many know, comes from the EU and just four countries. And, and then if you look at current emissions, you know, about half of that is from, is from China. Um, but more importantly, thinking about the inequality um, aspect of this, is that the, le the least developed countries have per capita emissions that are an order of magnitude less than the, than the big emitters. And so this, uh, dealing with this through loss and damage and other mechanisms is really important. Um, and this is why I remind of the UNFCCC principle of common but differentiated responsibilities uh, so, that, so that we have mechanisms, develop mechanisms to, to uh, support that principle. So, um, I'd like to mention then the 1.5 target, um, which is an extremely ambitious target. And the reality is that we have missed the opportunity to meet this target uh, with emissions reductions alone. So uh, this, this window has essentially closed. So we will require um, negative emissions or carbon removal. And so that's why if you look at the graph, it's, it's negative, right? We have to remove carbon from the atmosphere. And there are mainly two ways to do this, conventional methods, which you, some people might call them nature-based methods, or novel methods, which use, use technology. And so, and so we need to understand better these options and, and make the right choices. Um, and how do we do this? Um, climate resilient development uh, sort of connects this to, to the human systems and, and ecosystems and creating an integrated response. And so today's speakers will pick up on pick up on some of these issues across the different systems and sectors. So um, I like to give, in spite of all this bad news, I like to give some, 
some good news. And, and you mentioned this also, Leo, the, the cost of renewables has come down remarkably um, in a way that no one predicted, um, particularly PVs, but also for electric uh, vehicle batteries, also for, uh, for wind, particularly onshore wind. And so this has really enabled uh, the transition in a, in a quite significant way. Um, so uh, I'd like to come back to another historical example um, about the transition in technology. Uh, so this is a picture of New York City, 1900. And um, I think you can see it's only horse and carriage on the streets. So 13 years later, how did the same street look? Well, it was full of cars. And, and I think we tend to think that technology is moving very fast nowadays. It did not move that fast in the past. It has always moved pretty fast. It's just a question of why and how, and how are we going to, to stimulate that in the right direction. So I would say that um, technical change has always been fast and disruptive, and the challenge in addressing climate is, is to adopt this all of society approach, which, which Leo also alluded to, which can endow that change with public purpose. So let me say a little bit about uh, ASEAN, and our speakers will, will pick up on Mekong and, and ASEAN issues, but just to highlight that the, these interconnected risks between climate and nature are quite significant in the region, and they sort of represent the, the global challenge in a way. The high share of the population exposed to climate risk. Um, the region depends highly on, on forestry, fishing, and agriculture. Um, it has this rich biodiversity, but it's also responsible for more than half of, of the world's greenhouse gas emissions caused by land use change. I just want to repeat this fact because it's pretty remarkable um, that around 55% or more than 50% of the land use emissions are coming only from this region. So this, this really has to be reversed. Um, it's critical. And, but looking at the bright side, there are many benefits to regional cooperation in Mekong and, and ASEAN. There's complementarity in the technical capacity. Um, we're seeing coordinated climate response. Technical cooperation on carbon removal is, is quite, uh, quite promising. Regional bioeconomy uh, can be developed for sustainable use of biodiversity. So then I just want to briefly hand over to, to the other speakers uh, who will cover the, the system transformations that are needed, renewable energy, water, agri-food systems, and financial systems, and we're particularly um, interested uh, in finishing up here with financial systems and looking at that puzzle and how it fits together. So, thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Francis, for uh, giving such a um, uh, very good uh, bridging towards uh, our uh, panel session uh, today. And um, before we're talking about energy transition in Southeast Asia, uh, please allow me uh, to introduce a little bit about our organization and then uh, how we actually, what, what we're actually doing uh, in terms of energy sectors in Southeast Asia. Um, so, uh, ASEAN Center for Energy, we are an uh, intergovernmental organization. We serve the, uh, the 10 ASEAN member states uh, on the energy sectors. We are within the structure of uh, ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nation, and our mission is to harmonize energy policy and energy strategy in the region with the uh, regional economic growth and also environmental sustainability. So when talking about uh, energy sector and especially energy transition, it's not complete without talking about the uh, APAIC, uh, which is the ASEAN Plan of Action for Energy Cooperation. So this is basically the Bible of the uh, energy sector in ASEAN. Uh, everything that uh, the, 
the ASEAN do uh, regarding energy cooperation is all guided within this uh, document or that we call API. The target, the regional target, and then the vision, the strategy within the next five years are all included in here. Um, so this document basically uh, updated every five years, uh, and uh, we are trying to uh, see, we are trying to include what are the regional strategy uh, and vision within these five years, what are their actions, what are their, uh, the key topics, key technology that they, the region would like to explore within the energy sector is all included in here. And that's what uh, we are doing as well at the ASEAN Center for Energy. Uh, we're always coming back to this uh, document and uh, one of the mandate that uh, we are doing is also that uh, we are uh, publishing the uh, ASEAN Energy Outlook. So this is our um, flagship product. Um, the ASEAN Energy Outlook is actually the official reference when talking about ASEAN energy landscape. The document itself is endorsed by the ASEAN Minister of Energy just uh, last, sept uh, last two weeks ago uh, in September in Laos. Uh, this uh, edition, eighth edition uh, has been endorsed by the ministries, uh, the energy ministries of 10 uh, ASEAN member states. So basically this document is actually um, showing the energy trends and also projections within the region um, from 2022 until 2050. And we're using four scenarios. Uh, we have baseline scenario in here basically uh, talking about the historical trend of the uh, energy up in the in the uh, in the region and then we have the uh, ASEAN the AMS target scenario which is including the national targets so we include all of the poli national policies including their uh, power development plan within this uh, scenario and then the third scenario is we're using the regional aspiration scenario, which means the regional target that was uh, written in the APAEC previously, we are using that in here and see the projection whether the region would achieve that target or not. And uh, last but not least, we also have the carbon neutrality scenario uh, using the aspiration for uh, ASEAN strategy for carbon neutrality to be achieved in 2050. So um, when we're talking about the region, uh, especially in the energy sector, we know that the ASEAN region itself is, uh, is one of the fastest growing economy in the world. Um, the, the average uh, economic growth of the region is much higher than the global average, which is uh, we projected to have 4% uh, annual average economic growth. And also with the, with the increasing population in the region itself, energy demand is inevitably increasing. Um, and we expected to see an increase almost three folds in 2050 in energy demand based on, based on the historical trends. And these can only, we can only see these reducing uh, approximately around 48% if the region would like to achieve their regional target uh, with only uh, driven by the uh, energy efficiency in the region. So this is what we see, the condition of the energy demand in the region itself. So while the uh, energy demand is increasing, uh, w w when we see the, this fact uh, in the region, so then how about the uh, energy supply? So across scenarios, we see, unfortunately, fossil fuel still continues to dominate in the region. Um, in the historical trend, we see that uh, uh, also, not only in the historical trend, but also when we see the national policies we included there in the projection and as well as the regional target, fossil fuels still continue to dominate the energy mix. And, uh, only when it comes to the uh, carbon neutrality scenario, it's showing almost 80% reduction in uh, fossil fuels due to a shift towards clean technology and renewable energy sources. So this is show that um, energy transition is needed if we don't want the um, region to continue to, um, 
to relying on uh, energy uh, on the fossil fuel. Because uh, what will happen if this will continue, then uh, we can see here that the supply itself uh, within the region then we. Uh, Will, the region will have import dependency, and this has become uh, the closest threat for the region. Uh, as of now, uh, ASEAN remains a net exporter for natural gas and coal, uh, although uh, we projected under the historical trend, it will become a net importer of natural gas by 2027. Uh, and then coal, ex coal exports are expected to continue through 2050 under the historical trend, uh, with a gradual uh, decline, but these uh, growing reliance on uh, fossil fuel imports uh, definitely could impact the energy affordability and also increase price uh, volatility in the region. So that's uh, for sure. So then uh, when we see this, okay, the region has um, import dependency and uh, for, for fossil fuel import dependency and this has become the closest threat. So then what are the regional doing and what are the status for the renewable energy in the region itself? Um, so the region actually pushing for renewable uh, energy uh, that they have. So uh, within the... Uh, energy cooperation blueprint that I mentioned previously in APAIC, we have a target, which is to uh, reach 23% share of renewable energy in the total primary energy supply by 2025. Unfortunately, uh, as of 2022, we only reach the target of 15.6%. Uh, That's still 7% gap um, than the, to meet the target by next year in 2025. So uh, this is an alarming situation that uh, we need to we need to um, that we need to do something in the region itself. And uh, in terms of the stages uh, of renewable energy, hydropower continues to be dominant renewable energy sources, and then geothermal energy supply increases significantly, while uh, modern biomass faces growth constraint but remains critical. And we can see also solar and wind energy uh, see more uh, notable growth uh, and projecting a sharp rise to 47% by 2050, uh, especially under the carbon neutrality scenario. So with all of these uh, that uh, with all of this condition uh, in the energy sector in the region, so what are the things that the um, that the region that the initiative that the region are trying to do? So one of the initiatives that we do is uh, we're trying to push on the initiative for ASEAN Power Grid. Uh, this is a uh, this is meaning um, cross border uh, power market, cross border power trading. Uh, and we aim uh, to have more uh, energy security within this initiative. And uh, we also see uh, the region to optimize um, the uh, optimizing biofuel and biomass through interconnectivity. We also have several regional in, uh, initiatives on the oil and gas sector. But well, one, of the, uh, one of the flagship projects that we have also that we are currently pushing is the ASEAN Climate Change and Energy Project, where we are trying to actually put the vision of carbon neutrality within the blueprint of ASEAN Energy, or with, which was the APAIC that I min mentioned previously. So the document is renewed every five years, and it will be conclu concluded in 2025. So we are gearing up to have the next uh, cycle of, the, of this document in 2026 to 2030. So what we are trying to do is that we are trying to input the inclusion of the just energy transition and also the vision to reach uh, net zero within the uh, ASEAN Energy Cooperation. And uh, I think as uh, Leo previously mentioned in the, in the keynote, the dialogue are changing in, uh, nowadays. And this is what we see in the region it's, itself, that even within the energy sector, they are trying, uh, they are right, right now currently start talking about uh, climate initiative and also net, how to reach net zero. So this is uh, good news for us, uh, I believe. And uh, so, yeah, I think for the way forward, uh, I think uh, what is important, especially regarding regional cooperation, we need to develop supportive reg regulatory frameworks and policy that 
uh, incentivize investment in clean energy technologies while ensuring energy security and affordability and of course foster international cooperation as well. And I think I'm going to stop until this. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Aldila. Uh, Dr. Pedak, would you please uh, give us your presentation? Ladies and gentlemen, I don't uh, agree with those projections for the future of ASEAN energy. Change is happening much faster than those projections uh, to a renewable future. The unthinkable has happened. Nearly all of our national governments have adopted targets for net zero uh, in the coming decades. And the governments in this region have all adopted targets for renewable energy, albeit uh, modest in many cases. Our keynote speaker, Leo's S-curve, is here. And for all of us in the research and the policy influencing community, this is our time. If we are any good at our jobs, we have the opportunity and the responsibility to help our governments, to help our businesses uh, make this transition fast, just and sustainable. The energy transition requires building vast amounts of infrastructure. That provides opportunities, but if it's done in a bad way, that will have very negative impacts on people and the environment. Solar and wind have won the energy race. This graph shows the net global additions of different energy generation sources in recent years. Look at how solar PV is soaring. Coal is dead. Nuclear is vastly uh, too uh, prohibitively expensive. Conventional hydropower is being priced out of the market. The future is solar and wind. But solar and wind, as you know, uh, are variable sources of electricity production. And so to support this transition, there must be uh, a major investment in electricity storage. And there are really only two off-the-shelf technologies to do this. One are batteries, and the other is pump storage hydropower. They each have their strengths and weaknesses. Both are needed. Uh, I'm arguing that in this region, uh, we need to get behind a massive investment in pump storage hydropower. Now, for many of you, you will recoil in horror at the thought. Uh, this region has experienced vast amounts of contestation over the negative impacts of conventional hydropower development on people and the environment. Let me explain what pump storage hydropower is. Pump storage hydropower is not conventional hydropower. It can be built off rivers. It can be built by reoperating existing hydropower reservoirs. Uh, the Pump storage hydropower involves two reservoirs, that when there is extra solar and wind electricity, it pumps water uphill so that it can be stored and release water downhill when electricity is needed to meet demand. Because this can be built uh, off river, there are two orders of magnitude more sites that can be chosen to develop this infrastructure. That means our societies have the choice to select the sites that generate the most socioeconomic benefit in the energy transition while avoiding those sites that have the worst impacts on the environment and people. Uh, ANU has developed an open source global pump storage hydropower atlas and this is one screenshot from that atlas. You can go to that website and look it up right now for this region. Uh, and you can see that there are 40 times more sites than are needed for Asia to move to uh, fully renewable uh, energy. With the help of Australian aid, uh, we are working with 
uh, partners in the region, particularly national governments and utilities, to identify options for them to expand hydropower storage to facilitate this solar and wind uh, transition. Uh, the government of Thailand uh, already has three pump storage schemes and is looking to invest in more. Vietnam has advanced uh, plans for at least three of these systems and Cambodia and Laos uh, are looking at these. This is an example from our Global Pump Storage Hydropower Atlas, and it highlights how an existing hydropower reservoir in dark blue can be modified to add this electricity storage function. The existing uh, ZKMN uh, uh, pump storage uh, uh, reservoir, I should say, uh, only generates uh, around 120 uh, megawatts of electricity, sorry, no, 290 megawatts of electricity, whereas the pump storage addition, uh, one example is highlighted there in white, uh, can store three gigawatts, three gigawatts, 10 times the amount of electricity with the addition of a very small uh, reservoir. At ANU, we have been working to help utilities and governments in this region identify how to build out this new renewable infrastructure in the most cost-effective way that minimises social and environmental impacts. We have a high-level so-called firm model that identifies what infrastructure you need to build in what sequence to meet a particular reliable electricity supply target. When do you invest in more solar panels? How many? When do you invest in more transmission lines? When do you invest in more uh, electricity storage? We are producing heat maps. Uh, this is an Australian example, but there are heat maps to identify where the existing transmission line network is and where does that cross uh, the areas of greatest uh, solar and wind generation potential. Uh, to enable you to place your infrastructure in the locations that will maximise your existing uh, infrastructure uh, investments. Uh, and we have the Atlas to identify pump storage sites. So let me finish with two slides to talk firstly about the benefits of the solar wind pump storage investment. Uh, firstly, it increases security of cheap and renewable electricity supply. Pump storage hydropower recirculates water, so it doesn't need uh, to top up those reservoirs, and so it's independent of droughts uh, and other climate-induced impacts. The dry season generation potential uh, of the solar wind pump storage complements the existing conventional hydropower systems. The existing conventional hydropower systems have reached the end of their utility uh, because while they produce a lot of electricity in the wet season, they're not that great in the dry season. There's no point in doubling down on conventional hydropower. By moving the electricity production off river, it gives our societies choices to re-operate the way the existing hydropower reservoirs are used. Instead of dedicating them solely to electricity production, they can be used to produce a range of other services for society, providing water for people and the environment, for example. The, uh, the use of existing reservoirs maximises existing infrastructure investment, these can be located on steep and marginal lands that avoid agricultural lands, avoid the need to relocate people, and avoid important natural habitats, increases the flexibility of uses for water in rivers, uh, and importantly, uh, can enable more power trade between neighbouring countries. And so to finish in terms of policy solutions, for us to make this happen, we need to help our governments enable homeowners and businesses to invest in rooftop solar. In Australia, uh, private uh, homeowners and businesses are adding three gigawatts of electricity every year. 
Uh, we need variable time of use electricity tariffs so the pump storage hydropower operators can recoup their capital investment. Uh, we need electricity markets to include new markets for ancillary services, again to defray that upfront capital costs. Uh, the ANU tools can be applied. Uh, we recommend identifying renewable energy zones to concentrate that generation infrastructure to maximise use of a minimum number of transmission lines. Uh, we need to make sure that the host communities in rural and regional areas benefit with income and jobs and community services. And then finally, we need vast numbers of renewable energy technicians, uh, and we need to train tens, if not hundreds of thousands of these people to help us manage the transition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Uh, Hang Pham, will you please uh, start your presentation? Good morning, and thank you very much for the invitation for FAO to share a few perspective and experience uh, when talking about building re climate resilience in, in uh, agriculture and food systems, or agri-food system as a term that we use in FAO. Um, when, when thinking about the solution for climate resilience in agri-food system, the first thing comes to my mind, and also the FAO experience, is really the importance of the system approach. Well, the UN Food, Syst uh, Food Systems Summit in 2021, the, the series of dialogues toward that, as well as the movement of actions after the, the summit, really give a big boost to the recognitions of the system approach in dealing with agriculture and food sectors. So the food, agri food system is not only the complex network of food productions, processing, distributions, consumption, and disposal, but it's also the linkages of the food system and the drivers to that in the natural system, including climate change, in the human system, including demography change, urbanizations, and others, as well as the institutional environment and the services. So dealing with like food system, particularly with the aim to reimagine the future foods, rethinking of the current food systems for the transformation, it's really important to think with the system approach solutions. And it's very interesting to see the national uh, government commitments for agri-food system transformations. So why in some other regions, the build resilience to vulnerability of shock and stresses come as a top priority in the five action track for food system transformation in our region, shift to healthy diet and sustainable consumption pattern is a top priority with the recognition that those will actually create demand for sustainable uh, productions of food and for, to reduce uh, food waste, as well as boost like, uh, nature positive production. It's, it's, a, it's an important element to deal with the underlying drivers of increasing risks of climate change and disasters in the regions. Now, with the, food, I mean, with the system approach, SFAO, and also thinking about climate resilience and environment resilience, we've been promoting the when different terms you choose, landscape approach, ecosystem approach, river basin approach, or um, that, that. But basically, it's a kind of integrated intervention that deals with water security, food security, and resilience of community and, and ecosystems. And that brings, for example, protections of the headwaters with, I mean, dealing with deforestations and forest degradations with the watershed management down the line of green or nature-based solution water management infrastructure that also deal with flood and drought risk management and combined with climate resilient agriculture, uh, be that in crops, livestock, or agroforestry, and down to coastal resilience. And, and just not only production, but it's also combined with like a value chain, uh, the access to market that actually increased the resilience of the livelihood. 
Um, and within that kind of like ecosystem, the intervention for the communities that we are working with needs to be locally appropriate and defined based on the needs and the context and vulnerability and risks that the communities are facing. Well, this is, you will tell me that this is not new. We've been talking about ecosystem-based approach and other for decades yet, but it has not been easy with the different institutional mandates, with the different institutional arrangement, the lack of coordinations and the way resources are allocated. But with the climate angle, I mean, the, and, and the collective, increasing collective understanding of the needs to deal with the system, um, as mentioned by Leo in the keynote speak, I think there are opening opportunities to really take this approach more proactively and more like accelerating this approach, particularly in the region as the experience of FAO. Um, here's an example of the uh, landscape approach for the Sustainable Rice Landscape Initiative in the Asia region that my colleague Bo Damon, who is online, has been developing in collaboration with many partners. Uh, that is not only bring out the more like sustainable climates, uh, resilient and low carbon production practices, but it also combined with uh, green infrastructure, ecosystem restorations, as well as the whole services system uh, and the enabling environment with governance and financial mechanism that, that blending the public and private finance as but and it's not only climate resilience, but it's also like the the possibility of carbon emissions and and looking at the carbon market in the rice uh, systems. Um, another example with the systems and integrated approach that I would like to bring up is the way that we are uh, promoting agriculture climate services. And in FAO, we define agriculture climate services ranging from long-term projections a vulnerability and risk assessment to inform foresight planning at different level and scale, be that adaptation planning in the agroecological zones, be that the even village land use planning in Laos, or planning for the, I mean, modeling to understand the climate model suitability of certain commodities, like in the case of banana here in Laos. But it is also like the annual and seasonal forecast as well as early warning of climate-related disasters and also other disasters and shocks. Like, for example, the, the case of the agromat services in Laos that are informing the adjusting of the farming systems, the, I mean, the different type of planting for season, as well as the farming practices, as well as the combined uh, drought index that inform the triggers for anticipatory or early actions in, in the case of drought. Um, last but not least, it's because we are asked about how do we finance all of this. For us, the life increasing finance to farmers, access to finance to farmers and the community is the most important and central in, in the way we are working. So here, the diagram it provides an example of how we look at that. Uh, with farmers and communities in, in the Philippines to a climate resilient agriculture program where we use the climate finance to actually reorient the agriculture subsidies. It's 50 50 percent cost sharing between the Green Climate Fund and the government of the Philippines agriculture banner programs. So the climate finance is really hard to bring in the model of financing farmers uh, with different inputs for them to transition or tr I mean, tr to the climate resilient practices. But that is also leverage, for example, the climate resilient agriculture lending uh, with the banks uh, and the different kind of microcredits and insurance mechanism, as well as the local financing through the local government units, which is increasing in the case of decentralizations in the Philippines. So this is the way that we're looking at how bundling the kind of like services and, and promoting like access to finance uh, to farmers. Last but not least is the work with the ASEAN. Um, when looking at the system approach, the need for integrated approach, we and other UN partners, uh, agencies and other partners also try to bring the different pillars in the ASEAN, the different sectors body. And, and, and institutions to look at, for example, linking the sustainable agriculture strategy 
uh, the guideline for responsible investment in agriculture with the new strategy on carbon neutrality, as well as the approaches like adaptive, shock responsive social protections, which the ASEAN member states have taken on very proactively, and the framework for anticipatory action, which is the first ever globally with the intergovernmental organizations in the world. I stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, to close us out with uh, finance, um, Christina, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks to my fellow panelists and also our keynote speaker for really setting the scene from the big picture motivations and, of course, the different sector initiatives that are ongoing in the region. So I'll not repeat what has been said about uh, Asia being really at the front lines of climate change, but I wanted to just highlight on this slide uh, two references from WMO on the empirical side of uh, climate exposure in the region. At the same time, also a UNEP publication, another sister agency of ours, highlighting the gaps, particularly in adaptation finance, and how much, um, how, how significant this gap is in its effect or contribution in why we have, we're suffering um, massive uh, economic losses and damages brought about by climate change. Um, and thanks to um, uh, Francis' presentation earlier, um, what they wanted to really focus on the work that we do at UNDP is how we influence financial systems through systemic reforms, not just in the public sector, but also in the private sector to facilitate climate finance flows, um, not just to the national government, but also to the subnational government. So you will see in this diagram, um, but you could also find and read further from the UNEP publication, is that there are five areas of interventions that could facilitate or address um, climate action gaps. And I've put the arrow on number four and number three, which is where our work at UNDP at the Climate Finance Network is uh, focused on. And here you will see that there is a need um, for a central administration in charge. So in our case, we work very closely with ministries of finance and sector ministries for the vertical um, integration from finance ministries and also down to subnational level, but at the same time also horizontal integration, ensuring that finance ministries work with the sector ministries to ensure that the plans and projects that are proposed by, let's say, Ministry of Environment or Energy are accounted for in the Ministry of Finance uh, plans and priorities. And similarly, we are also looking at um, different particular coordination mechanisms and subnational plans. And I'll uh, detail uh, some of those uh, briefly in the next few slides. So just a li little bit of a background about the work that we do at the CFN, uh, at the UNDP. We're support supported by the UK government as well. Um, we do convenings, we provide technical support, and we do provide capacity building and really foster partnerships using uh, international processes. Uh, we support about 18 countries in the Asia Pacific, uh, which is a mix of uh, countries in Southeast Asia, the Pacific, and also South Asia. So on the right, you'll see some work streams. And for us to be able to influence the financial systems at the country level, um, we do have interventions from the perspective of climate-aligned planning and budgeting. So we have certain tools that we have used um, and deployed in countries to be able to influence how they plan for projects to ensure that climate change is mainstreamed in their budgeting process. Another is also interventions on access to climate finance, and we also have some tax and innovative work, particularly blended finance, so that we could also ensure that if governments cannot uh, put up the t t pay for everything, and of course ODA also has its own limitations, that the private sector, especially the like-minded ones who are able to realize the profits or the incentive mechanisms that could facilitate flows uh, could also support um, climate action at the country level. And of course, um, we want to make sure that climate finance really reaches the people who need it the most, the uh, communities that are impacted most by climate change. So we're ensuring that gender and social inclusion is also mainstreamed in any of these climate finance initiatives. And last two is transparency, because um, it's very important for practitioners and citizens alike to know what the government is doing and what partners like us are doing to support um, governments, subnational governments, communities, and CSOs in the climate change. As our keynote speaker mentioned, and also Francis, it's a whole of society approach, and we're part of a big puzzle contributing to something big with incremental steps. 
And of course, lastly, the science part of the work we do is uh, modeling the impacts of climate change. We've started this in Cambodia a few years back, but we've really started this work at the economy level so that um, decision makers like ministries of finance, for example, and the sector ministries would have an empirical basis in their decision making. So when they do, um, do climate priorities, it's based not just on the climate exposure, but also on the different sectors impact on GDP. And this is using data that's available and downscaled to the country. And so in the work that we're doing with um, different country and uh, national governments in particular. These are just, a, this is a snapshot of the tools that we have been supporting in the region um, in the past 10 years or so. So we do climate change fiscal frameworks or essentially also climate finance strategies where you do an institutional assessment of the enabling environment. So because it's one thing to know what your problem is and you have the scientists and experts who could really design appropriate solutions, but are the implementation mechanisms in place in government, in the partnerships to facilitate these solutions to materialize and be successful? Of course, another is budget preparation. It's um, um, FAO did mention in their GCF project that they had counterpart project, um, co counterpart funding rather from the Philippine government. So by ensuring that climate priorities are embedded in the budget, um, it, it highlights and also shows the commitment of the government in terms of their prioritization of uh, climate change. So CBT, climate budget tagging, and of course, um, audit and scrutiny are working with parliaments is also another thing. Um, just on the private sector side, because as I mentioned, it's not just always um, the governments who are footing the bill and also development partners. We look at also the prioritization of how the NDCs or the NAPs, for example, these uh, UNFCCC uh, plans and priorities are able to help prioritization in terms of investment planning. So there are ways that we are doing this in the country and we are doing this also through an enabling environment, through pipeline development and facilitation and capacity building. So for example, for the private sector, UNDP has supported and provided some training and convenings on green bonds, thematic bonds. We've done this in Cambodia and Indonesia, also starting in the Philippines, looking at the enabling uh, environment for issuance of guarantees, especially to reduce the risk for the private sector to invest in climate action. Um, these are just a few also of the activities that we're doing in the region. For example, um, we're doing a landscape on the climate finance flows, particularly for adaptation. We mostly, we mostly know what's uh, the flows for mitigation and the investments for mitigation, but adaptation and resilience is still an emerging area. And so we're trying to map that out in the region as well. Similarly, aside from the fiscal frameworks that we've supported, we're preparing an adaptation finance strategy guideline together with other development partners so that countries will have a tool that they could customize uh, as they try to implement and walk the talk on their climate plans. So these are some regional initiatives that we're doing. We're also working with some philanthropists to ensure that there's awareness among government officials that philanthropy is another source of climate finance. But at the same time, on the right side, the lighter blue, you'll see some country work that we're doing. So again, climate finance strategies, resource mobilizations, because governments, we know that there are already a lot of plans, but not enough flows are coming in to those prioritized areas. And so we want to bridge the gap between planning and investment. Uh, and lastly, um, these are just like case studies where I wanted to highlight uh, experience of our team where we're able to see or experience all the six work streams I mentioned earlier where we're helping countries mobilize and manage uh, climate finance. So, for example, in the Philippines, uh, they, they have something called the climate budget tagging or the climate change expenditure review. So we're supporting them to enhance it, not just to make it digital but, and improve the usability and the analysis capacity, but also to integrate gender and so social inclusion in the tagging. At the same time, we're also helping the Department of Social Welfare to be able to shift from a response-oriented emergency kind of uh, positioning to more preparedness and climate adaptation orientation. So Philippines is also included in the modeling work that I mentioned earlier, and I also mentioned the blue bonds. And we're also working with the Ministry of Finance, for example, on the climate, fin um, climate finance strategy. So in this way, we're able to address climate finance, access, transparency, um, gender, planning, and also um, modeling. So we have some similar work in Indonesia where we're able to go to the sub-national level where climate impacts are uh, experienced the most. So I think I'll, I'll stop there and thank you so much.
Thank you very much, Christina. Um, I'll be taking questions from the floor um, in a minute, uh, but I'd just like to start off with, um, in the interest of time, an overarching question for all of our panelists. Um, and we can go down the line here. Um, you've covered every major aspect of the climate transition from your experiences, and I'm hoping you can give us some examples here. Um, what is standing in the way of a unified or coordinated approach to adopting these transformations at scale? JV, would you like to start? I actually wonder whether we do need a coordinated approach in that in terms of the electricity transition, what's happened in Australia was that uh, households and businesses were able to put their own solar panels on their roofs. And that forced governments uh, and forced industry uh, to follow suit with the energy transition. It changed the way the transmission network worked, it undermined the economics of coal-fired power, and it increased the economic importance of uh, electrical energy storage. And so maybe grassroots up uh, can work in some cases. Christina, what do you think? Yeah, um, I think uh, there's a lot of work that we have been doing, not just UNDP, but our development partners in trying to mitigate this uh, coordination gap. Like, we work with the development partners, let's say, Coalition of Finance Ministers for Climate Action. So we work together with ADB, UNEP, and then having common partners and so exchanging information amongst ourselves like let's say in Cambodia if ADB is supporting the agriculture sector we're supporting the rural and land sector for investment strategies so in this way we're able to contribute to the country's uh, adaptation or resilience package not instead of having silos so so there I'll do that yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Francesca. I think I will have a different, uh, a, a slightly different take with what uh, uh, Jamie here has said. Uh, I think because especially in the region, in the ASEAN itself, uh, perhaps we are very different uh, with, Aust with the Australian case. Uh, and in terms of uh, energy cooperation, for example, uh, ensuring that uh, deeper energy cooperation, meaning that we are uh, um, basically, we are harnessing collective resources uh, as well as uh, experts. We strengthen also uh, capacity uh, buildings in there and mainly addressing for, uh, for challenges that perhaps individual countries will be struggle to, to, uh, for that. But then regionally, regionally uh, that we can uh, definitely work together on, on uh, addressing these challenges and uh, also with uh, having an aligned policy, harmonized framework, uh, one of the things that we can push forward, I think what uh, perhaps very different what Jamie would say, would be the ASEAN power grid that we are uh, definitely uh, pushing forward into. Because um, we actually not only that within the cross-border uh, power market uh, regionally, that will, it will help uh, electrify uh, for the uh, regional, uh, itself, but also in terms of uh, mitigating climate change, uh, decreasing, uh, utilizing more renewable energy sources, this is where the uh, regional cooperation also help uh, in terms of that. So I think that will be my answer. Thank you. Yeah, I think for us it's really about this kind of um, the coordination and multi-sectoral approach to the agri-food system transformation. So despite all the government commitments, so the agri-food system transformation may still be seen as the job of the agriculture sector. Why is not? It brings other sectors and it requires all of the work together for this kind of like landscape integrated interventions to be designed and, and implemented that, I mean, tackle on the different kind of like uh, objectives of ecosystem restorations of biodiversity, conservation and sustainable use of food security and nutrition and others, as well as like leveraging the different sources of finance. Yeah, I think that um, the multilateral system has, um, has been getting better at this type of bridging and, and coordinating functions, but I think that um, countries are still organized by sector um, and so creates certain gaps and, and barriers. But, and here I think the regional cooperation plays an important 
role because it can address these, these cross-cutting issues. If we take, you know, the, the sectors of, of land and biomass and car where carbon management is really important, like, like I was mentioning, um, here you can get some of the, find some of the co-benefits and synergies for health and well-being and adaptation and so forth. Um, I got the Time's Up sign, uh, so unfortunately we won't be able to take any questions. Uh, five, five minutes, okay, I have five more minutes. Um, will you please raise your hands and we'll take two questions at a time. Uh, if you have anything to raise with our panelists. You can raise them a little higher so I can see them, please. Um, they're in the back and um, over there, sir. Hello, everybody. Uh, I have a few questions. Uh, one is, uh, what strategy we set up in the energy transition in the world? That means you want to reduce how, how much redu reduction uh, transition from uh, traditional energy to the renewable energy. And the second question is, uh, um, when we use a solar, um, solar system, so if, um, if the battery of solar system is a uh, runoff, we, uh, how, do we, how we solve this problem? And the third question, uh, do we have any uh, guidance documentary for climate change financial, financial in, in the world? Or uh, is depend on the current state of um, own country. And I found some the uh, some the um, type of energy. The that means the renewable and the clean energy. What is different between them? Thank you. Thank you, um, sir. Please ask your question. Yeah. Joydeep Gupta from the Earth Journalism Network. Question for Dr. Pitak. Uh, so uh, many of these pump storage projects that are coming up, one pro actual pro practical problem that is being seen is that many of them are located in so-called protected areas and in indigenous lands. Does your atlas look at that? And uh, to what extent would that 40,000 number come, to, come down? Perhaps if I could address that question first. Yes, the Global Atlas does look at that. Uh, the Global Atlas excludes and does not report on any sites that are located within protected areas uh, recorded on the uh, World Database on Protected Areas. In terms of Indigenous lands, lands of minorities, uh, it does not screen for those on the online version. That's a very important issue that must be addressed uh, when it comes to each country um, screening for the sites it can choose. But because in Asia there are 40 times more sites than are needed to back up a fully renewable electricity system, it should be possible to identify sites that have uh, acceptable social and environmental outcomes. I'm sorry, in terms of the other questions, I didn't quite hear them, so I can't really respond to them. That's all right. Uh, Francis, perhaps you can take uh, the question. I think the question was about how much renewables do we need, um, roughly. And um, I mean, uh, of course, this is a global issue, but uh, one thing I, I tried to point out that the the less emissions we reduce, then the more negative emissions we will need. So the more renewables we get, the easier it is, um, not just renewables, but also efficiency and, and reduced emissions from land use and so forth. So it's not, it's, um, we need a significant amount of renewables and we, we need to phase out coal in particular, but, um, but what is really, crucial is that uh, the more we can reduce emissions from renewables and, and from land and from efficiency, then the less we need to, to go negative, which, which can be challenging. So uh, I would put it that way. 
And if I might briefly add, we will need a lot more electricity as we decarbonise society, as our vehicles move to electric vehicles, as we need water for climate change adaptation to do things like treat water or install air conditioning, we will need a lot more electricity per capita than we have today. I'd like to thank our brilliant panelists. If you could please give them a round of applause. And thank you for your questions as well. Um, if you could, uh, could we please show the live drawing of the session from Tofu Creatives? That's very cool. Uh, well, everyone, thank you so much for, uh, for your attention um, and I wish you a good rest of the day. everyone. Okay, so uh, we are a tiny bit behind, but not by much. There's 15 minutes for coffee. Please come back at 1120. Thank you.